Now, I want to introduce Dr. Andrew Lover, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Biostatistics and Epidemiology. He has an He's an expert in infectious disease. He's done a lot of work in the area of malaria and has done field epidemiology, both in terms of designing, implementing, and analyzing clinical trials internationally related to infectious disease. So we're really thrilled to have him here today um, to give us a talk on, as you see, what we know, what we don't know, and how we can plan within our community. So thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you all, everyone, for coming. Um, it's great to see so many people here. And um, yeah, it's, so this is an incredibly fluid situation. Um, slides made a few days ago are hopelessly out of date. Um, and that's just part of the territory here. Um, one moment here. So a quick disclaimer, all of the opinions in this talk are mine alone and not reflective of the School of Public Health, the department, or the university as a whole. Um, some things here may be obsolete as of a few days ago, so definitely consult CDC and mass.gov for the most up-to-date information. And last but not least, um, a lot of the data here are preliminary. So um, people are publishing huge numbers of preprints a day. Um, that are not peer reviewed. And so that's just part of outbreak epidemiology and it's um, just part of the course, but all, all important caveats. So coronaviruses are a large group of viruses um, and there's a small number that cause infections in humans. So there are four that cause routine respiratory infections. Um, so every winter about 15, 20% of routine um, colds and influenza-like illnesses are caused by four different coronaviruses. Past those, there are several that we've seen a lot in the news in the last few decades, which are the original SARS coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, and this is what a very, very sick camel looks like. And these are the ones of major international concern. The nomenclature here has changed multiple times in the last few months, um, and it's finally been clarified a little bit. Um, so right now the illness um, is called COVID-19, so coronavirus disease 2019, and the virus is called SARS-CoV-2. And this is very similar to how we talk about HIV. So <laughs> HIV is the virus and AIDS is the human infection. So um, even in the press though, you'll see mixing and matching and a lot of um, confusion around that. Okay, so the general structure here is we're going to do a little bit of background on epidemiology and some terms you've probably seen a lot in the press that um, may be confusing and we'll talk about some of the reasons why those numbers change daily and seem very inconsistent. Um, we'll talk about what we do know about the virus and the human disease that's been um, seen in multiple countries. Then the main part is gonna be talking about very simple practical steps based on CDC and DPH guidance for things that we can do right now in our communities to help the global efforts. And then I'm gonna try and leave as much time as possible for questions and answers because I suspect there will be um, quite a lot of that. So the, the few things we need to talk about here is an epidemic is a very general term for any time you see more of a disease than expected in a given population. And you can define the time interval in the population in a lot of different ways. So this is generally a matter of you know it when you see it. You see very few measles cases and suddenly you see a huge number. You have a problem. Pandemic um, just is an epidemic that is in many regions globally. And this is also quite poorly defined. So there's no official definition for when a series of epidemics coalesce into an epidemic or a pandemic. So there's been a lot of discussion at WHO level about when this may or may not be a pandemic. It's kind of academic. Um, WHO has some important political considerations for, for that kind of thing and it really won't change um, any of the response efforts or how they're organized. 
Um, so just to note that. So the very first signal that anyone saw was captured on ProMed, which is an international consortium that scans the web and print newspapers and flags anything that seems unusual. And this happens multiple times a day, there are ProMed alerts. And vast majority of the time, after a few days, there's some lab work and some epi investigations. And they, they find out what the um, pathogen is and it's resolved. In this case, um, December 30th, they said in, in Wuhan, there was an urgent notice of unusual pneumonia of unknown cause. And this, this is the exact scenario where the global health architecture said, huh, this, this is an important event. And quite quickly, um, China did some very aggressive um, infection control response measures, including quarantining large cities. And then by January 30th, so just one month later, um, there was a whole series of meetings in Geneva to discuss the public health emergency um, declaration. And so we have gone from a literal handful of infections in one city in central China to a map that looks like this. And this is um, a, a web interface from um, Johns Hopkins updated near hourly. Um, and you can see there's a large cluster here in Iran and then Italy and um, a growing cluster in the northeastern or northwestern US. And so in, in eight or nine weeks, um, we've gone from, from a very, very local problem to a truly global one. And this really highlights how incredibly interconnected um, global systems and travel and um, human health are. So the important terms to think about, you probably have seen in the newspaper here and there, susceptible means um, you can be infected. And th these are all general terms, not specific to COVID-19. Infectious means you currently have the infection and you're able to infect other people. Um, subclinical infections, there's also been a lot of talk in terms of um, you may be able to transmit, but you're not really, really sick. So one of the original um, case clusters in Germany, there was a woman who went to a business meeting and she apparently felt pretty well. She was, she was definitely well enough to go to a meeting and, and participate and then subsequently was um, diagnosed with COVID-19. And that's, this is one of the big considerations in terms of how you, can, how you plan and control um, diseases. If there's a lot of subclinical infections, um, your, your problems are um, magnified. So this is a little bit of a schematic of why a lot of the data you've been seeing in the press and WHO are contradictory and confusing and, and really hard to parse. Um, so basically, this is all the people in your population. Um, and you have people with symptoms over here, which run from severe to moderate. And then you have this kind of gray area of mild or none, where people may be sick, but not super sick and may or may not go to a hospital. So they're never necessarily captured for in terms of health surveillance. And your data quality um, generally parallels this. So mortality is a, generally a very easy metric. Um, it's, it's clear and distinct and well recorded in, in most health systems. In the middle here, um, clinical disease and subclinical disease, you have a lot of differences in terms of health. virus or um, bacteria or whatever. So here I'm just talking about virus, your human host here at the top, and your environment. And all sides of this triangle are dynamic and constantly shifting and balancing. And we have the ability to easily intervene 
from a public health standpoint in terms of the human host and the environment most of the parts of the agent itself are pretty driven by the biology of your your pathogen so so there's there's less ability here and so all of public health programming um, is looking at the parts of the triad that you have the ability to do something about and then prioritizing them in terms of your resources and um, what you know about the current um, epidemiological situation. You've probably heard a lot about case fatality ratio or case fatality rate. Um, and this is really one of the metrics that determines the severity and seriousness of a new pathogen. Um, and it's the total number of deaths over all the people recorded with clinical disease. And so, so right now, there's a huge amount of effort globally um, trying to refine estimates for this from all the, the countries that are currently reporting cases. Um, a broader and, and potentially less biased estimate down here is the infection fatality ratio, which is everyone who is infected who may or may not have visited a clinic. And that's really the number everyone would love to see, but that's much longer in the future. So we're stuck here with, with this um, case fatality ratio. Um, there's been a lot of talk on Twitter and other social media about reproductive numbers. So this is the basic reproductive number for any disease, you can measure this. Um, and there have been a lot of pretty extreme values that have been suggested for COVID-19. And it's basically the, the product of the probability of transmission per contact. So you have two people that have some kind of a contact and there's a chance that your virus will be transmitted. The contacts per unit time, so how often people in your population interact with one another, and then the duration of infectiousness. So this right here, duration of infectiousness is really a, a fundamental part of each individual virus, and we don't have any ability to, to do much about that. The other two are the places where all of your public health interventions can target. And this is really the driver of, of all the global planning, is to try and think about the best way to um, look at R0. So if your R0 is less than one, on average, each infectious person is able to transmit to less than one other person, and your infection just goes away. And this is what happens for a lot of diseases on a regular basis. Um, if it's right about one, it kind of skips along and is endemic. So that just means you have kind of constant low level transmission. And then epidemic is when R0 gets much, much bigger than one. And that's an arbitrary threshold. And this is all for a fully susceptible population. So usually there's a lot of um, complications in terms of vaccine coverage and that kind of thing. For COVID-19, no one on the planet outside of a few countries that have a lot of transmission has any immunity. So um, humanity is essentially a fully susceptible population, which is important. <clears throat> okay, so what does this look like in terms of the current global estimates? Seasonal influenza is about 1.2, so it just barely skips along year to year. The Ebola virus um, in 2014 was about 2.2. And the best estimates now for COVID-19 are somewhere between 2.3 to 3 to 5. There's a massive range. So if you do a quick search on, on PubMed, um, you get a lot of very inconsistent numbers. And this is why it's important. Um, so through this time course, um, you have the ability to look at what your r naught is doing and think about what interventions you can do to drive it down. And the closer we get to one globally, the better it is for every well, below one. Okay. So there's been a lot of talk about, is this just the flu? And is there um, a bit of um, media sensationalism and, and that sort of thing? Um, these are some very specific numbers that um, suggest otherwise. Um, as I said, no one on the planet, aside from, from central China and Iran and Italy, has immunity to COVID-19. That's a problem. Seasonal influenza, there's a lot of cross immunity between flu strains. And within the community, there's, there's reasonable levels of, of coverage to a lot of different flus. 
case fatality rate um, for COVID-19 is somewhere around one to two and a half percent. And it seems to vary a lot by health systems, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Case fatality rate for seasonal influenza is one per thousand in a fairly severe normal influenza season. So just comparing those two numbers, that's um, somewhat worrisome. Um, based on, on large case series from, from China and Hubei, um, 20 to 25% of all persons presenting to a clinic need um, intensive care. So whether that's ICU or more intensive interventions, um, it's really a large number. Um, in a normal flu season, it's um, about 0.05% um, at a population level. So th those, that's a large contrast. We have no vaccine or antivirals yet for COVID-19. Um, you're obviously aware we have annual flu vaccines. And finally, um, this bottom part, uh, we have very little knowledge of, of best treatment protocols um, in hospitals for, for people with severe COVID-19. Whereas for influenza, decades of, of really well-validated um, treatment protocols. So the most recent estimates that have come out about um, are not um, are from a modeling group in London, and they're using the, the reporting data from um, these four countries and from others to get an estimate of, of what the numbers are looking like. Um, Italy, Japan, Singapore, and you know Singapore is down here just ticking along. The, the dotted line is the R not of one that everyone's aiming towards, so they're doing a quite good job of, of um, disease control. Um, South Korea, there's a big wave here um, starting about February 10th or so. Italy, February um, 18th, uh, there's also a big spike. I should note that those are probably artifactual. Um, as testing improves, um, or testing coverage improves, you get more and more cases. And that's probably what some of these big jumps are. So they're not necessarily a measurement of transmission. But clearly, um, you know, well above um, where you would hope to be in terms of an R not of one. And these are being constantly updated. If you want to go to this website, they um, update their code like three times a day. So the, the density of data from this outbreak is, is unprecedented, um, which is a great thing for, for really rapid progress, but also difficult in terms of um, trying to keep up to date for everyone. Okay, so the most detailed information we have right now is from um, <clears throat> the Chinese government and their, the CDC has a national level electronic record um, surveillance system and WHO and um, the, the Chinese CDC did a joint mission. Um, they re re released this report last week. Um, and the main findings here, so this is based on 56,000 cases recorded in the, um, up until February 20th. Um, age is, is 50 years or so at the median, um, some newborns and some very elderly people also in there. Um, the vast majority were, were middle-aged um, people, um, male, female was about matched. And then 22% uh, of the farmers are laborers, which kind of um, matches the general Chinese demography. So there, there's nothing, it's not a really um, shifted population. So this is the data they've presented in terms of what their case fatality estimates look like. And at the very start, um, in, in both um, Wuhan and other areas in Hubei, you start off at 15 to 20%. And this is really a measure of, um, you have the very, very sickest people coming to the hospital, which are the first people you're capturing. And so you have a very biased estimate of how severe the, the fatalities may be. As you have more and more um, mild cases come in, and you're seeing a larger part of the underlying illness, this starts shifting down. And so um, both um, throughout all of China, this, this number has steadily declined through the epidemic and is now somewhere down around one to two to 3%, depending on how you slice and dice these data. And again, um, it, Seasonal influenza is one per thousand. So even, even down here at the low end, um, that's, that's an important um, difference. Um, this is their, their chart of the, the um, kind of spectrum of illness that they saw in all of the reported cases. 
So um, in the, the top left with mild cases, the vast, vast majority have no problems and have full recovery with a very small arrow here going down to, to more serious and potentially fatal outcomes. Moderate cases, so this is people with reasonably severe pneumonia who you, you probably hospitalized in a lot of general circumstances. Again, um, quite well, but then this arrow here for, for mortality gets a lot thicker. Finally, at the very um, severe end here with severe cases and, and people who are admitted in, in critical condition, um, the outcomes are very poor. Um, and so this, that, that bottom part of the, of the iceberg again is, is um, worrisome. Um, for, for health systems. Okay, so in terms of the symptomology that was reported from this 55,000 cases, um, it's all very general and nonspecific. So you can imagine right now, um, China has a temperate climate, so they have a flu season not dissimilar to the US. Um, people presenting with fever and cough and fatigue and muscle pains and general flaws, it's gonna look exactly like seasonal influenza. Um, and so that, that was one of the big challenges um, in China to, to try and do reporting before there was widespread testing is that um, the, the, the symptoms are, are very general, aside from, from the very severe cases that had um, some pretty unusual um, lung um, involvement, but that's required x-rays and, and other more extensive um, work. Um, based on, on these data, the, it was about five to six days um, on average uh, for the appearance of symptoms. So, um, but the range here was one to 14, which is probably a bit of reporting bias because it's, it's difficult to have people remember when they may have been exposed. Um, there's a second publication that just came out a few days ago. Um, it, it appears to overlap to some degree with the other data, but not completely. Um, and it's, I'm not entirely sure that the difference is there. Um, but this is a, a, a smaller number uh, so a larger total number, but then um, the confirmed and suspected breakdowns are a bit different. Um, the age distribution is, is similar, and a really, a really great note of optimism in all of this is that um, younger children and um, school-age kids have very, very little burden of disease. Um, so that's, that's great for, for public health planning. In terms of the spectrum of disease of, of 44,000, so this is just the confirmed cases over here. Um, you probably heard this 80% number bandied about, so, so 75, 80% of people have pretty mild illness. Um, and then 14% in severe and 5% in critical. 5% um, critical is, is not a small number, um, even though the, the total seems fairly really small. The CFR from here is 2.3%. As you go up in age, so, so the very elderly, so over 80, um, it goes up a lot. And this is definitely a, um, a factor of comorbidities. So people, um, older age groups have a lot of pre-existing conditions. So, um, you know, uh, diabetes or heart disease or COPD all probably impact the, the evolution. Um, and then in, in Wuhan, at least in this case series, 63% of, um, the healthcare personnel um, were infected, at least in some hospitals. So this just really reflects the, the massive surge of cases in, in hospitals. And just um, infection control, it gets really difficult if you have way too many patients on a regular basis. Um, one other important note here is um, the differences between droplet and aerosol. Um, so, so droplets are when you sneeze and there's this fine mist that literally sprays out and lands on people. Um, aerosol is very different where you have very fine particles that stay suspended in the air for a longer period of time. The good news here is that all data so far um, suggests that um, COVID-19 is only droplets. So if someone sneezes, there's like a six foot radius that is a little bit worrisome, um, but it's not a matter of, of you know, broader problems. Okay, this is a, a limited list of the things we currently don't know that people are rushing pretty hard to, to get data for. Um, kind of the course of an epidemic outside of large cities in Asia. Um, 
the case fatality ratio with all the outcomes taken in there. The earlier data, for, for all of those, there's a, a fair number of patients who they didn't have outcome to when they reported. Um, the case fatality ratio in places with potentially very weak health systems and limited ICU capacity. Um, so there have been cases reported in Sub-Saharan Africa in the last week or so. Um, and ICU capacity is a huge, huge constraint. Um, how often do people have um, viremia or able to transmit virus before they actually have symptoms? Um, the potential for reinfection has been talked about. There have been some cases where people appear to have um, another infection, but it's not clear whether the testing may have missed kind of an intermediate time point or whether immunity may be uh, more complicated than we think. Um, and then clinical predictors of severity. So in terms of triage and hospitals, um, kind of validated protocols for, for taking out the very severest patients for subsequent um, higher intensity interventions. So that's, there's probably five more pages of ideas along these lines that, but probably these are the, the most best. Okay, so that's, that's where the situation is globally. Um, and the important thing is there's a lot of things we can do right now um, to, to help uh, potentially mitigate any um, transmission that may occur. And a lot of this is based on influenza. So, so globally, all of the, the planning documents at WHO and CDC have been um, based around pandemic influenza, but there's a lot of coming up. And so most of it um, is directed. So there's two broad classes of, of um, things we can start considering. The very top are non-pharmaceutical interventions, which include infection control, social distancing, quarantine or isolation, and potentially closures of schools, businesses, and large events. Um, at the bottom here, we have vaccines and antiviral drugs. There are um, multiple companies working to um, design vaccines. Um, and there's, there's a fair amount of knowledge from the 2003 SARS epidemic that um, there's, there's hope that those vaccine um, candidates can be removed. Um, but that's a much longer term process. The like, best case scenario is probably six to eight to 12 months. Antiviral drugs, there's um, at least a handful of maybe more clinical trials underway currently in China with um, drugs that we know work well against viruses of similar nature. Um, yeah, but that will also be a longer term um, goal. So how do all these fit into the, the evolution of an epidemic? You have a small number of cases here, you're kind of ticking along at the top left. And up here at the top is your, your very basic um, testing and um, contact tracing, field epidemiology. This is just like dealing with a very um, crisis situation. Um, then as, as you kind of progress along here, this whole um, spectrum, then you can start doing everyday personal non-pharmaceutical interventions, which we'll talk about in lots of detail, because that's really the, the best tool we have right now. Um, and then much further, further along here in the kind of mitigation stage, you've got um, more invasive and, and complicated um, situations in terms of school closures and teleworking. Um, and we're starting to see this in, in Seattle. Um, and so it, it's probably good to at least file all that away in the back of your head, but we, we don't have that anything to worry about currently. Okay, so I've put a little camera icon up here. And there's five slides. If you want to take a picture of them, put in your phone, feel free. Um, they'll also be online for everyone. Um, else online. But these are the really simple basic things that we can do um, as a community to, to um, start thinking about what we can prepare for. So the top one is the things you learned in preschool and kindergarten that you maybe don't always do um, during flu season. And I'm just as guilty as that as everyone. So um, we'll talk about those in detail. The second one is just simple planning discussions with your family and neighborhood and just setting up some very simple systems for a what if. So, so if we have widespread community transmission, there's a plan in place to think about what you can do. And then longer term, um, 
if there are major impacts, something along the scale of Seattle, um, to try and plan for, for some of those in a broader term. So all of these are directly from, from CDC guidance. Um, I've retooled the first part a little bit because it's a little bit easier to, to grab onto. Um, the reason all of this is worthwhile and useful is the dark purple is what a pandemic could look like, a hypothetical pandemic could look like, if none of these interventions are um, in place. And so you have a huge spike, and the problem is your health system um, comes under increasing stress. Like if you have a huge number of cases presenting all at once, your clinical capacity and, and kind of resources um, start to struggle. If you have the exact same number of cases, but you spread it out over a much longer time course, your health system has a lot more resiliency. So this is, I mean, doctors can only work so many shifts in a row. Um, and so this, that's really the goal of this, is to, to lengthen out the epidemic and um, delay the entire onset, reduce the peak so your, your health system has time to, to, to respond. And then um, if done well, it can change the trajectory of the entire epidemic. So this is all pandemic um, based on non-CDC flu pandemic scenarios. We're not at pandemic yet. Okay, so um, two days ago, CDC released um, a whole package of um, COVID-19 community level um, action plans. Um, and basically they, they, they took um, large portions of the, the US pandemic preparedness package and, and re, um, we oriented it toward the, the more acute crisis right now. So at the top, you've got your rules for preschool. Um, this is the website here, um, which is up right now. And then CDC has these three steps, plan, act, and follow up. Um, the URL is there at the bottom. Take a picture if you want. And the rules from preschool are really easy. Like wash your hands a lot and more than you think and for longer than you think and just be a little bit um, hyper focused on that that's probably the simple easiest biggest thing use a tissue or your sleeve if you sneeze or cough it sounds obvious but it's easy to not remember to do that um, avoid touching your face whenever you can especially if your hands are not clean don't share utensils water bottles all the general things that you're not supposed to do stay home if you're sick and this can be quite challenging if um, your um, employer um, sick leave time is, is, is challenging, um, but for kind of the greater community good, it's, it's important. Um, wipe down and disinfect common surfaces wherever possible. Um, keep a, a distance from people who are acutely ill where possible. And then probably avoid handshakes and, and close contact with, with people in general. And this feels awkward in terms of just social interactions. Like, that's weird. Right? You want to interact with your peers. But for, for at least the short term, it's probably um, good to, uh, to consider that. Okay, hand hygiene. The steps are here. Um, we all know how to wash our hands, right? 20 seconds is a really long time. So you need to either sing happy birthday twice or the alphabet song all the way through. And I can guarantee very, very, very few people will go over 20 seconds. So that's important. Um, and you kind of need that, that amount of time to really do all the things that need to happen. Um, soap and water are definitely best because you're a lot more active about how you actually wash your hands. If it's not available, um, the alcohol-based gels are fine. Just check the label. 60% um, is what you want. So there are some brands that are, that are different from that. Um, that may be a big challenge right now in terms of um, stockouts and that kind of thing, but that's, that's a whole separate uh, concern. Um, washing your hands seems like the most trivial thing in the world. It's really, really hard to do well. And um, in clinical settings, they've done really amazing studies to quantify um, how it works and the places people miss. So your thumb and fingertips, pretty much everyone misses because it's just easy to do what you do. So um, yeah, so, so think carefully about getting full coverage from, from your hands. Face masks, there are two very different types of face masks. The, the very soft cotton ones you see are surgical masks. 
and the much stiffer ones sometimes with a valve on the front are N95s. Um, there's also N99s and some other ones, but probably N95s are the ones you'll see. Um, and they're for very different purposes, even though they get used quite interchangeably. So surgical masks trap droplets. So if you're sick and you're sneezing and coughing, it physically contains those droplets. So people around you are not exposed. But it only works when it's dry. So if you do a lot of sneezing and coughing and the, the cotton gets all wet, it's not really working very well. So that's, that's one challenge there. N95 masks can decrease exposure if you're around someone who's acutely ill, but it has to fit well. And you probably saw there was a, a CDC graphic that showed all different kinds of uh, beards and facial hair and potential problems with, with N95s. Um, it, they have to seal really tightly and they're really uncomfortable. Um, so if, it's, if an N95 feels great, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a challenge there. So, so um, that's for, for healthcare workers, that's a big um, important issue. So along those lines, stockpiling face masks um, could potentially be really detrimental for overall preparedness. Um, so frontline health staff desperately need those. So um, I think Germany just banned the export of all um, face masks because they were, there was like selling all through the EU and people were kind of profiteering on it, um, potentially impacting um, local um, health systems. So CDC right now does not recommend that um, you wear a face mask to protect yourself. Um, but if you do have symptoms, it will help potentially um, keep transmission down. And then again, they, they highlight the fact that, that frontline health staff um, really need the, the supply. Okay, so the next stage in the CDC um, preparedness plan is talk to the people in your house or neighborhood or family um, and just, you know, scenario a little bit about what some of the, the potential situations could look like. Um, consider some extra groceries, like it's probably good to have some extra pasta and tuna on the shelf, but don't go crazy. That's not necessary or helpful. Um, if you have essential medications, that's actually something that you probably need to um, do your best to get a, a preloaded supply. If anyone in your family has a um, severe um, or chronic illness, it's probably good to think carefully about um, what extra care they may need and then um, make contingency plans for that. Have an emergency contact list, including um, local numbers. So obviously 911, but 911 doesn't always work really well with cell phones and especially here in the hill towns. Um, yeah, so, so think a little bit about that. And then get a flu buddy or a pandemic pal. And this is just specifically talked to, this is especially important if you live alone or maybe you have a lot of housemates and everyone's kind of in and out and no one's really sure where everyone is. And the idea here is just make sure you check in on each other. So if no one's sick, call each other once a day and say, hey, is everything okay? Do you need anything? If anyone's acutely sick, then you probably need to do twice a day and do a lot more active um, checking in with that person. And it's a two-way street. Um, and maybe talk a little bit about if, if anyone's sick, how you'll deal with the logistics. So you can have a very general conversation. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, a detailed uh, protocol or SOP. This is just a, you know, back of the envelope sketch. And more detail on all these are down here at the CDC website. Um, CDC guidance in, in the event of local transmission. Um, if, you're, if you're ill, definitely um, stay home. And even if you're not sure what the illness is, it's good to to not um, go out in public. Um, take your household action plan and, and start working on it. If possible, um, have a separate bathroom bathroom and bedroom for anyone who is ill. Um, again, this is you know, if possible. And then um, kind of the broader implications here are, are trying to do scheduling um, for your workplace and any disruptions in childcare or school schedules and like the, the really um, fundamental nuts and bolts of <coughs> trying to, to get um, your family schedule together. And the question is, how well do all of these type activities actually work? Um, we have really great data. This is again from the, the WHO um, China Joint Report. Um, so back here, the first stage, um, you can't read these labels, but you can read over here. So this was very basic field epidemiology of just trying to get a handle on 
what in the world was going on and trying to isolate the pathogen. The second stage here with the red arrow, um, there was mandated reporting, fever checks, isolation and quarantine, traffic restrictions. So you've, you've read about all these um, uh, really aggressive um, <coughs> control measures put in place. Um, and that's right about the time the epidemic peaked, and there was a really sharp drop after that. Um, and so, you know, large scale um, systems to, to really minimize the, the frequency that people mix um, can have a huge impact. But there obviously are economic and social and, um, you know, a lot of other complexities to, to this, this issue. Okay, and then just a couple slides on longer term considerations. Um, isolation and quarantine are, are different. So isolation is if you're clinically ill and um, you have a, you know, a validated um, diagnosis, then you're, you're put a little bit away. So the, the chances of you um, transmitting are lower. This is usually in hospitals or other healthcare settings. Um, and then quarantine is where you've been exposed and, and potentially have been infected, but we don't know. So there's, there's a time period where you, um, are, are just in, in not mixing with, with the general population. So Singapore um, put in um, quarantine no, requirements um, three. based on, on COVID-19. So There's about another a way to get fine if you break your yeah. quarantine, which is a reasonably good incentive. Um, so yeah, th those are potential um, longer term. Um, larger scale potential impacts on the health system could look like some of this. Um, the hospitals could be very yes, overwhelmed in terms of yes, staffing yes. equipment um, and PPE materials, um, especially if there starts to be hospital-based transmission um, among healthcare staff. So that's happened um, in both South Korea and um, there's been a couple other uh, clusters of, of um, healthcare staff um, having really high infection rates. Um, and, and vaccine development will be a ways off even under very optimistic scenarios. Um, and so WHO is warning potential for, um, for shortages of equipment and um, countries are looking at their total ICU beds and kind of scaling what things could look like. So nothing worrisome yet, um, but just some, some things to, to consider. And then uh, potential social distancing. So this is, this is what's been just been enacted um, today in, in Seattle and the, the King County. Um, closure of schools um, massively limits the, the number of people that are um, outside and interacting, um, both parents and kids. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's the, the aim there. So um, in both Japan and South Korea and Italy, all schools are closed for uh, at least a couple of weeks and then in some cases much longer. So the, the, the WHO says there are about 300 million kids who should be in school, who are not. Um, so there's, yeah, it, this, is, this is, it's happening um, just as a, as a consideration. Okay, so these are four websites that are constantly updated. Um, we're incredibly lucky to have the CDC and really dedicated professionals that do fantastic work. And especially here in Massachusetts, we're lucky to have a fantastic a DPH, very competent and very experienced um, and well-resourced. So um, yeah, so those, those are the four links. And there's a little quote that I think nicely summarizes um, the balance between um, being alarmist and, and being well-prepared. The take a message, we should prepare, but not panic. I've read that there are no seasonal factors involved, but for the flu, of course, it's the winter season, yeah. the winter climate. Um, is there anything updated about that? Yeah, so the question for everyone that's online is about um, potential seasonality of um, infection, um, like, like seasonal influenza. Um, really, we don't know. Um, even, even kind of tropical climates, um, like Singapore um, and Malaysia, have flu seasonality. 
Um, and so trying to extrapolate from that to a total of that. Yeah, it's, I mean, certainly in the wintertime, people are in closer proximity to one another and everyone's indoors. Whether that's enough to kind of really tip it, um, yeah, we, we simply don't know. So as far as the fatality ratios, we're not really sure where that lies yet, but I noticed that in your definition, you said clinical disease. So do the subclinical um, diseases not count into that fatality? Correct. Yeah, so subclinical diseases you generally don't even know about. Um, and so longer term studies can look at everyone that was exposed with, with more sensitive um, serological tests. And then you have your full denominator. So not having updated numbers on those things aren't as concerning. In the, it's more the... Um, the, 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 one, the one challenge to answering that is that the, the rate at which health systems capture and report cases varies dramatically. Um, and so even, even the clinical cases in different settings, you may see different numbers or different denominators. So um, yeah, it's, it's, once this all quiets down, people can do some very detailed surveys and we'll get a very specific value. And this is what happened for SARS, um, but it took a much longer time to, to really nail those numbers down. Yeah, it, it's almost certainly zoonotic. Um, so there's been some talk about pangolins. Um, it, it's almost certainly from bats. Um, there was a very similar virus um, isolated um, in China or maybe Cambodia um, eight or ten years ago from from a bat. Um, yeah, so that's that's definitely. It. But there there may have been a species in between. So the bat may have infected pangolins or some other animal, and then, but the, the ultimate reservoir is um, almost certainly bats. <clears throat> the so, so the the two uh, the, yeah the 2003 um, SARS virus um, was from bats, and then probably also a civet cat, which is a little little mammal, um, and it's disappeared since then. Um, presumably, there are bats out there that still have it, but we just don't necessarily know. Yeah. Can you talk some about the issue about the diagnostic testing? The U.S. Um, seems to be doing a lot less. South Korea is doing a lot, and CDC is being criticized. Do you have any? It's a really complicated issue, um, and some of the logistics are that um, it's a BSL three plus pathogen. So there's very few labs in the U.S. that can be certified to run that level of testing, or at least in terms of the, the, the laboratory environment. Um, and so that was originally um, why CDC kept it fairly constrained and also to make sure there was really complete reporting. Um, I, I think um, increased testing rates will, will definitely um, help. And it sounds like there's a lot of effort right now to try and uh, push tests out. I mean, a million tests in a short period of time, even if the tests are physically there, um, manpower at, at all the public health labs is constrained. So I mean, um, that's that's the main issue is just having physical people to run um, massive numbers of tests. I, I'm not sure if uh, if this test uh, is there a conversation about this test being um, fully subsidized by the government. Yeah. So I just heard um, very recently that the governor here in Massachusetts has said that all the testing will be free. That was anecdotal. So if anyone has better information. Yeah, he did say that. Okay. Okay. So that, that's been confirmed. Um, so yeah, that's, that's not a concern. Um, other states may have different. Um, they also said that commercial labs could now start making the test. So I didn't know if that meant that they were backing off of the BSL3 lab oh. requirement. I'm not sure. That must have. And also in South Korea, they're doing like 10,000 tests yeah. a day. So that that drive through testing. And, standards yeah. Of, yeah. I mean, it's, labs, right? I think, I think if you're in an environment where there's widespread transmission, uh, being really worried about BSL-3 is a bit of a disconnect. Um, but here in the U.S., since we just have um, very few reported cases, then there's a concern to, to try and um, uh, keep it fairly, um, fairly well worked. Yep. Also, there's a concern with international travel. Are you walking with your hand? No. Yep. 
So, so college age kids um, or students look like they have very little disease. So that's great for you. Um, it may be a bigger concern for communities if, if you have exposure and then you come back. Um, there, you, if you do travel, you should definitely consider the, the potential for a quarantine when you come back. Um, and 14 days doesn't sound that long, but if you're stuck at home watching Netflix for 14 days, uh, yeah. So, I mean, that's, um, so um, there, there's good guidance actually on the UMass coronavirus website for, for those issues. Um, do you think it's necessary for the college student like at UMass to start wearing masks or like no. increase amount of the no. big activities? Yeah, I mean, so, so, so if, if there is um, widespread transmission in Massachusetts, then that guidance may change. But right now, CDC um, does not recommend anyone wearing a mask unless, unless you're actively ill. 